Psychological horror is a subgenre of horror that attempts to mess with your mental and emotional well-being. It aims to scare you by getting in your head as opposed to showing a monster or some other tangible threat that you can vaguely understand. Psychological horror isn't an easy genre to get right, be it in movies, games or books, but when a piece of media does successfully mess with your head, the results can stick with you for a long time, regardless of whether you want them to or not. For movies I'd say The Silence of the Lambs best represents psychological horror. Hannibal Lecter spends much of the movie in a prison cell and yet he is so unbelievably creepy that he gets in your head even when he poses no possible physical threat. I don't tend to read many horror books these days, I used to and I remember Stephen King's It being incredibly scary, although I was about 12 or 13 when I read it, and was also scared of getting changed in the locker room and talking to girls, so it's not an especially useful opinion. One piece of Stephen King fiction that really got in my head was a short story of his called The Jaunts, which was initially published back in 1981, although I read it later in a collection called Skeleton Crew. On the face of it, The Jaunts is a simple story about a teenage boy travelling with his family from New York City to Mars via teleportation technology. Teleportation is fairly safe, certainly safer than standard space travel, but it does require you to be knocked out before the trip. The boy is a bit of a rebel and is determined to find out what happens if you remain conscious for the trip so he doesn't inhale the knockout gas. I won't say any more in case you want to read it, but somehow this short story stayed with me for over 20 years, and this is coming from someone who can't remember books they read last month. Anyway, I should focus on video games where I'm inclined to use Silent Hill as a good example and more recently there's Soma. I might also include The Evil Within and perhaps Fear, although I didn't find that one especially effective as a psychological horror. It's not that I didn't like the story or find it scary at times, it's just it didn't get in my head in the same way as the ending of Soma did, which hit really hard. I don't consider the mere inclusion of weird trippy shit to necessarily mean a game is psychological horror. The distinction might lie in how much the game focuses on another traditional mechanic. Playing Fear it's not hard to be consumed by the first person shooter part of it, with the other stuff just a nice way to break up the pace. In September I had an itch to play some horror games because, well why do it in October like a normal person, and I ended up playing two games that were tagged as psychological horror in Steam, Pathologic 2 and Blair Witch. While Steam tags aren't always that reliable, I do agree that both games fit into the psychological horror category. The developers of Pathologic 2, Icepick Lodge, might not have been aiming for psychological horror first and foremost, but that's certainly how the game ended up feeling for me, whereas Blair Witch wanted to fit in that category but ended up failing miserably. Regardless of the developer's intentions, Pathologic 2 ended up being one of the best representations of psychological horror in a video game that I've ever seen. The game has significant flaws that hold it back from being an unequivocally great game, but it's definitely a very good one. It's a tricky game to recommend because even if you do consider yourself a fan of horror games, you might not be a fan of this particular approach to horror. Still, I recommend you try it out, especially if you're a touch fatigued with all the cookie cutter AAA open worlds. Whatever it sniggles, Pathologic 2 makes a strong emotional impact, you won't forget it quickly. Blair Witch, on the other hand, feels exactly like a cookie cutter walking simulator, or first person narrative experience if you prefer, and not even one of the good ones. The only scary part of Blair Witch ended up being the thought that I might have spent $30 on it if it had not been part of Game Pass. Blair Witch is a different type of game from Pathologic 2, most notably because it's far more on rails and lacks any notable challenge. That said, Blair Witch and any other game that really wants to get inside a player's head and completely mess it up could definitely stand to learn some lessons from Pathologic 2. This video will be relatively spoiler free, a lot closer to an in-depth review than a critique. That said, Blair Witch is a fairly short game and some of its more interesting parts come in at the end so I can't leave out late game stuff entirely. For Pathologic 2 I'll keep most of the footage to the first half of my playthrough, although it really is the type of game that benefits from you going in as blind as possible. Changes to the environment and even basic game mechanics could be considered spoilers in themselves, and I'm not one of those guys who is usually bothered by spoilers. I won't watch a Dark Souls video review and then complain in the comments that the video includes footage of Dark Souls. If at any point Pathologic 2 sounds like a game you want to play, then stop watching the video and go play it. I received a review copy of Pathologic 2 back in around May or June and I fully intended to play it, but the Witcher videos consumed most of my time and with every week that passed it looked more and more likely that Pathologic 2 would join my backlog of doom. The game crept back into my consciousness when I heard talk about how it hadn't done too well sales wise, and that the DLC of two new playable characters with their own stories might not get released. This had me tempted to jump in, although I actually have to credit Lord Mandalore with the final push I needed to finally boot it up. 
You probably already know who Mandalore is, but in case you don't, he's a YouTuber with a channel a bit like this one in that he generally focuses on old games, except his videos are concise and entertaining, unlike whatever the hell mine are. Mandalore has a video on Pathologic 2 which I watched a bit of before deciding that I clearly needed to play the game myself. The biggest hurdle when it comes to playing Pathologic 2 is the name. Despite the 2 in the title, Pathologic 2 is not a sequel to the first Pathologic, or indeed the HD remaster. Instead it's kind of a remake of the first game with some nods back to it for fans of the original, but it does work as a completely standalone product. Naming your remake of a relatively unknown niche game from 16 years ago as if it's a sequel seems like a really bad idea from a marketing perspective, but the game deserves to overcome its odd naming convention. You play as Artemy Baruk, who is returning to his childhood hometown after receiving a letter from his father, the town doctor, requesting help. Instead of a hero's welcome where you're reunited with lost friends who ask you to regale them with tales of your scholastic adventures in faraway lands, the second you step off the train, three people attack you and you're forced to kill them in self-defence. It's basically what happens when I return to England every Christmas. Those three strangers were after you because you look a lot like the guy who killed your father, which is also how you find out that someone just killed your father. You're too late, there won't be a family reunion. Although Artemy used to live in this town, he often feels just as much a stranger to the town as the player. The layout of the town is described as being deliberately confusing to navigate, so there's no disconnect between the player's uncertainty and the characters. All in all, it's easy to settle into the role of Artemy with little in the way of disconnect. Your first goal is to clear your name, or at least put a seed of doubt in people's minds so they stop trying to kill you or imprison you, and then of course find out who did kill your father. Artemy meets up with a couple of old friends, but they don't have a lot to say, and in the time he's been away, the town has had a few issues to say the least. Your return to town isn't the focus of everyone's attention, and for good reason. Once you've cleared your name, the focus becomes figuring out a cure for the plague that is spreading through the town, killing hundreds of people a day. Well, I say that's the focus, and narratively it certainly is. The major missions encourage you to talk to people who might be able to help with a cure, and you're strongly encouraged to treat dying patients, even if all you can do is delay the inevitable. However, realistically, your own focus is on the narrower goal of just trying to stay alive, because Pathologic 2 is brutally difficult. At no point during my 30 or so hours with the game did I ever feel like Icepick Lodge actually wanted me to reach the end. The challenge doesn't have much to do with combat or reflexes, it's more akin to a strategy game like Frostpunk where you constantly manage a limited number of resources, and even success feels like failure, just a slightly lesser degree of failure than it could have been. With one exception that I'll talk about later, the challenge in Pathologic 2 is simply maintaining 4 meters – hunger, thirst, exhaustion and immunity – to ensure you stay alive. If you're tired you need to sleep, although beware that while you're sleeping you will get increasingly hungry. If you're hungry you should obviously eat, but many foods contain salt which will make you more thirsty by eating them. Thirst is again fairly straightforward, although it's also linked to stamina, so the thirstier you are the less stamina you have to boost that painfully slow walking speed. Immunity doesn't become a thing to worry about until a few hours have passed, but essentially you must keep your immunity levels topped up by resting, using immunity boosters, and staying out of infected areas. If the immunity bar reaches zero, then you have a chance of getting infected, which in turn starts to eat away at your health. You really don't want to get infected. Survival meters are in so many games now that the chances are you're already familiar with them, but I've yet to play a game that implemented them as well as Pathologic 2. In theory, at least, I can see why games want to include survival elements to a system of meters like this. Making the player character do small things like eat, drink and sleep can help with that all-important immersion factor that people love to bang on about so much, as I did in my video on Metro 2033 actually. However, these systems rarely add much because the meters become busy work, a distraction from the main game that becomes less and less relevant the more you play. I can think of way too many games that include tutorials emphasising how you must eat, drink and rest at regular intervals, and sure enough those first few hours are a struggle as you scrape up the required gold to pay for a night in an inn, or buy a couple of apples for the road. But then the hours pass and you start collecting huge amounts of gold to buy fancy new swords and armour, by which point the amounts required for food, drink and rest become irrelevant. Fast travel is probably an option as well, so even if you do get caught short without food it isn't a problem. And let's not forget the almost inevitable skill tree that provides abilities like greater benefit from eating food or needing less rest each day. The game that started as a slow paced and hopefully immersive survival game soon ends up feeling a lot like another generic open world game with nothing to set it apart. 
His survival mechanics become a chore that you occasionally remember to deal with. Pathologic 2 takes survival seriously throughout the entire game. Food is always a scarce resource. Early on you're lucky if you can afford an egg and you will seriously consider eating rotten food. Just as you start to build up a decent amount of cash, the entire economy gets pulled out from under you and replaced with food stamps, leaving you feeling like you're starting from scratch. Water is relatively plentiful early on with fountains everywhere you look, but you need to keep thirst as low as possible because of the link to your stamina bar. This means you don't want to save water until the meter is nearly full because it hinders your ability to get across town. Once the infection spreads across town, the water supply becomes infected and pumps need repairing, which in turn requires heaps of resources. So before you know it, the once plentiful supply has become rare. Exhaustion is rarely a direct threat. Even though places to sleep are limited, you're usually in range of a bed. It's unlikely you'll collapse in the street due to exhaustion. However, managing exhaustion is still crucial because any time you spend sleeping is time you're not curing the local residents from a deadly disease or investigating all the strange goings on that demand your attention. In similar games with survival aspects, the relevant meters move ridiculously quickly, likely because the game's own day-night cycle moves quickly too. Trying to keep on top of all the meters demanding your attention becomes a plate spinning exercise because the second you've made it through the list once you have to start from the top again. This obviously becomes tiresome which is likely why those survival meters are subtly disregarded the more you play. Pathologic 2 takes place over just 12 days which will take you at least 25 hours to play through, and as a result the survival meters move slowly, largely replicating an actual day-night cycle. You don't need to eat, drink or sleep that often and when you do there's a mild feeling of accomplishment. You can't relax mind you because Pathologic 2 never lets up. Sure you don't have to worry about hunger for 30 minutes or so but there's still thirst and exhaustion and immunity and maybe you didn't acquire that apple through entirely legitimate means which is going to have consequences and so on. Pathologic 2's survival system isn't just engaging because it's hard. I'm sure there are plenty of survival games that are hard if you up the difficulty enough. Difficulty alone is not what I love about this game's take on feeding those meters. What's special about Pathologic 2 is how well intertwined all the systems are, and how even though it does occasionally offer feelings of accomplishment, it rarely offers feelings of relief. Pathologic 2's atmosphere is so oppressive that even when you're doing well by most objective measures, you're still punished. If I tried to offer tips to new players, they would all be structured as, well, you can do X, but this means Y will happen. That might be why I enjoy the sense of discovery here more than in many other games. Take something obvious like the Father Gascoigne fight in Bloodborne. If you don't use the music box, the fight is much tougher, so the obvious tip is to use that box and save yourself the hassle. It's hard to give tips like that for Pathologic 2 because all options are equally problematic. Normally when given a choice between spending your hard earned money to buy what you need or just steal it, the obvious option is to buy it. Except if you do that, you might not be able to afford an immunity booster to save a young child's life. Maybe it would have been better to steal what you needed instead of handing over money to the shop owner. Let's focus on hunger as an example of how it can all spiral out of control. The most obvious way to get food would be to buy it, but you probably won't have enough money to buy whatever you need from shops. You can find scraps of rotten food in bins, but that won't last long and it deals a slight hit to your health when you eat it. You could steal food from someone's house, but the residents will know and your reputation in that district will go down. Reputation is a major problem beyond the usual good and bad ending dilemma. For starters, if people don't trust you, they won't let you into their home in the first place, so next time you'll need to break in, which means you need lockpicks to even get in the house. Lockpicks are rare and break easily, and even if you do get in, you'll just become more hated in the town and so on. A low reputation means townsfolk won't trade with you, which rules out another significant way of getting food, and that's through the barter system. Most people you speak to have a random scattering of supplies and things they need with a specific value attached to each. Children can be a great source of resources because they place a high value on random things like marbles and don't seem to recognise the value of painkillers. Children also aren't allowed sharp metal objects so they usually let them go on the cheap. On the even more niche end of the spectrum there are the special merchants who only pop up at night and only take human organs as payment. As a surgeon you can perform autopsies on the dead bodies you find on the streets, but you'll need a scalpel and they in turn aren't cheap. The locals also frown upon the whole illegal autopsy thing, especially if you had to get creative with the way in which the dead body appeared there in the first place. 
This all leads to more damage to your reputation, which in turn means you'll become more reliant on that illegal organ market for food because no one else will trade with you. Low reputation also means you're more likely to get attacked on sight, and as I'll discuss later, that is something you really want to avoid. So what is the best way to get food? I honestly don't know. Ripping off kids was generally a good bet, although I wouldn't put it beyond the game to have that impact their survival rate without telling you. All I know is that you really don't want your reputation to go down and that is genuinely challenging. Even if you do figure out some solid tactics the second you settle into a bit of a rhythm, the entire town changes. The spread of the infection makes many resources scarcer while also offering new opportunities. For example, you can loot houses in infected areas without taking a hit to your reputation, although you aren't the only opportunist with the same idea. And of course, spending time in infected areas reduces your immunity and increases your own risk of infection. This constant battle to get everything you need where every success comes with at least a minor element of failure makes Pathologic 2 an unbelievably tense and suffocating experience, and that's before you worry about the whole keeping other people alive thing. One of the less satisfying but still effective ways in which Pathologic 2 keeps you on the edge is by limiting your ability to save. There's nothing like the thought of losing progress and with it 30 minutes of your time to keep you on edge. If you've watched a lot of my content you'll probably know that this kind of tension isn't one I'm especially keen on, and it typically feels cheap. There's a reason most people prefer putting clocks back in autumn instead of putting them forward in spring. Losing an hour of your time feels like crap and it's not how I like to entertain myself. If I really wanted to waste my time doing the same thing over and over again I'd talk about Epic Games Store on Twitter and watch the angry replies roll in. Pathologic 2 nearly convinced me of the error of my ways regarding save points. In fact at one stage it did have me convinced. See there are just enough save locations that you can go and save whenever you want, so long as you have the patience and resources to do so. When I did die it didn't bother me all that much, I could repeat my previous steps and maybe do things a little more efficiently next time. Each death is an event in itself, because when you die you're kicked back to the theatre director, who has a few words to say on your recent performance. Much of the game is framed like a play, and there are even special performances each night that you can watch if you have time. The theatre director sends you back to your most recent save, but not before punishing you. In my case he took a tiny part of my max health each time. There were threats of more substantial punishments, such as losing my voice or use of my hands, but I strongly suspect most people get the same treatment. Later on you can opt to remove these smaller punishments in exchange for a single more significant one. Death is a big deal here, and something would be lost if players just booted up a quick save on each death. The save system also lends more weight to your choices by eliminating save scumming, although I have to say I've never felt less inclined to save scum than I did here. Not only is it a case of all your options are terrible, you also can't properly understand the consequences of most of your weird and cryptic decisions until later in the game. It'd be like getting a do over on your choice of lottery numbers, but the draw hasn't been made yet. This might sound like a ringing endorsement of Pathologic 2's save system, but unfortunately I did end up swinging back around to something closer to my original stance by the end of the game. I think for the first 10 hours or so, the save system Icepick Lodge implemented worked rather well, but after that it probably did more harm than good. The reason for this is that in Pathologic 2 you will die one of two types of death, a good death or a bad death. I'm actually tempted to refer to them as fair and unfair deaths, but some people get really pissy about that kind of thing, considering any death that is in some way avoidable to be fair no matter how bullshit. To avoid that nonsense, let's stick to good deaths and bad deaths. Good deaths are the ones where you die because you didn't have enough food to eat, water to drink, or immunity boosters to keep the infection away. You can see those deaths coming a mile off and it's your job to plan for them. The fact this is difficult does not make it unfair. Not being able to quick save isn't a huge deal for these types of deaths, because you probably want to replay a decent chunk of your time to ensure you don't just die again immediately. If you died because you got infected and couldn't get a cure in time, the solution is to stay out of infected areas and get an immunity booster. You can't rely on getting an immunity booster from any one particular place, so you need to hunt around for it a bit. You also might not have enough money or have the goods required to barter for it. In other words, it's going to take time to remedy your mistakes. The save system forcing you to go back a chunk of time works pretty well here. Then there are the bad deaths. These involve a meter that I've not discussed yet, the health meter. Health is affected by, for example, eating rotten food, being infected, or taking full damage. It can be boosted with bandages and the like, or by resting. So far so simple. But the most significant threat to your health doesn't come from one of those sources. Instead it's from fighting with muggers, and this is the worst part of the entire game. As you wander the streets, certain miscreants will attack you. 
Early on this only happens in the districts where your reputation is low, but as people become increasingly desperate and the infection spreads, your chances of being attacked go up drastically. Fights also break out between random NPCs and you can decide whether or not to help. The problem stems from the combat system itself. Regardless of whether you are fist fighting, using a knife or a gun, the system is absolutely terrible. There's a basic block and attack system and one on one fights are generally manageable, however the system falls apart when more than one enemy is involved. You have no way of knowing where damage is coming from or who you will hit, so blocking and attacking start to feel completely random. Early on this was just an annoyance that stopped me from enjoying one minor part of the game's survival system. Yeah, I'd sometimes take more damage than I liked from fist fights, but I could get that back by sleeping. You can also run away so long as you have the stamina, which is just another incentive to not be thirsty all the time. There's even a way to cheese the fights a bit by running into another building because no one ever follows you inside. This also serves as a good motivation for maintaining a high reputation because it effectively means you have more places to hide. However, once you hit the roughly halfway mark, the terrible combat system goes from being a boring nuisance to an outright frustration that can have you ending a play session. As time progresses you'll get access to knives and even guns, although ammo is so rare you might be reluctant to use them. The enemies have knives too, and with them they can slash away your entire health bar in a second. It's not uncommon to get surrounded by three enemies and die before you've even had a chance to draw your own knife. The speed at which you can die is insane and this is a game where for the most part death comes hauntingly slowly. Pathologic 2 is scary when death is an ever present threat that you have to struggle against with every passing second. It's not scary because it kills you without warning if you happen to walk around the wrong corner at the wrong time. The game might as well crash, it would be just as satisfying. The problems with the combat system really hit home for me when I lost about 20 minutes of playtime after I'd headed off to a distant part of the map that didn't have a save point. Or if it did I didn't find it. I hadn't done anything special or challenging in that time and it wasn't possible to have been more efficient with saves, so in that regard I'd done everything right. I wandered over to this new region which took a long time because this game is slow. While over there I had a bunch of conversations and then I walked back, heading straight for my home base which happened to be the closest save point. I wasn't far off when someone ran up to me with a knife. Perhaps foolishly I decided to take them on because I wasn't sure I'd make it to a building before getting stabbed in the back. Unfortunately the shotgun was set up as my default weapon and it wasn't loaded. I died before I'd had a chance to react. Obviously this death was my fault in the sense that it was technically avoidable. I could have run or remembered that I didn't have any shotgun ammo. But that doesn't make you feel any better when you have to repeat the trek across the wasteland there and back, plus go through all the same conversations again. It's wasted time with no benefit. This sort of thing happened a lot in the second half of the game, by which point I had fortunately taken the deal to remove the death penalty. A few weeks after release, Ice Pick Lodge added in a couple of difficulty modes to make things slightly easier if you want, plus a bunch of sliders so you can get specific with which aspects of the game you want to be challenging and which you don't. Ice Pick Lodge even goes the extra mile and tells you how important each slider is to the intended experience, so if you'd like you can only tweak the less important parts. This is one of the best implementations of difficulty options I've ever seen, with one slight exception. No matter what you adjust, Pathologic 2 is never all that easy. You can't take away the challenge even if you want to, and it's clear Ice Pick Lodge wants you to play on the default setting. You even get a round of applause when you revert back to the default difficulty. When a developer expresses a preferred difficulty option, my recommendation is usually to go with that one, and I'm sticking with that recommendation here. The suffocating sense of hopelessness is absolutely crucial to the experience, so you should start with the intended difficulty and only change it if you can't progress at that level. The danger of making changes is that it's all too easy to keep making things easier and easier every time you get stuck, so it should be a last resort. You'll know you've found the right difficulty level when you absolutely dread booting up the game again. If you at any point ever look forward to playing Pathologic 2, you're doing something horribly wrong. I did try adjusting the sliders at around the halfway point to see what difference it would make and I have to admit I didn't notice any huge changes. Perhaps that's because my gameplay style had already adjusted for the harder settings, so I just kept playing the same way I already was. Maybe if you start at the lower level you don't develop the same knowledge and skill set, but it's hard for me to say for sure. Either way you can't make Pathologic 2 into a risk free walking simulator, and at a risk of becoming one of those people this probably isn't a bad thing. I'll talk about the story more soon, but the summary is that I really enjoyed it if enjoyed is the right word for a story like this one. Perhaps I'm glad I endured it is more appropriate. 
And that's kind of the point. For me, the story wouldn't be interesting without the struggle and the sense that you're enduring suffering. It's not a story I'd want to read or passively experience. The writing can be a little intense at times, and one of the reasons it works is because you often go long stretches of time without engaging in any important new conversations. If I had just been able to move from one quest marker to another for the entire game, I would have gotten bored really quickly. And after all, Pathologic 2 is a strategy game of sorts, so the difficulty discussion is different to that with action games, which can favour those who simply have quicker reflexes than those of us who are closer to 40 than 30, and fondly look back on the days of all you could. Oh yeah, there are difficulty options, but none of them make the game easy, and that's probably a good thing, or at least it's not a bad thing. Although of course, if the devs want to remove the challenge entirely, then that's fine with me so long as it's optional. Pathologic 2's difficulty is crucial to bringing out the psychological horror element because it forces you to watch on helplessly as everything falls apart around you. I was far more scared by the spread of the infection and my failure to save innocent people, including many children, than I was of losing some progress and trying again. I was constantly faced with choosing one person's life over another, like doing triage in an emergency room. You can't save them all, and trying to do so means sacrificing your own health. Many games do that thing where they let you choose between giving medicine to an NPC or keeping it for yourself, but let's be honest, how often do you really need that medicine? It never feels like much of a sacrifice, it's basically free XP. In Pathologic 2 I always kept a couple of immunity boosters for myself, instead of giving them to the townsfolk, again including children. I wanted a safety net. At the end of each day you're shown who got infected and whether those who were infected managed to survive. More than once I watched someone get infected when an immunity booster would have almost certainly saved them had I not kept it for myself. The one exception to my cruel streak involved babies. Saving babies from infected houses brings in generous rewards, but I wasn't doing it for the reward. Well, not completely. It was mainly to stop the sound of their crying. You can hear it from outside the house and it's almost impossible not to go inside to try and save the baby, even though you're risking your life doing so. When I did try to ignore the crying, I would often imagine I could still hear it, even when far from the house, as if the game was haunting me for being so callous. The sound design often torments you like this, but the crying babies were by far the most extreme method. The music also follows you around like a bad smell. The soundtrack is good in that it completely fits the aesthetic, it's just not necessarily good in that you ever want to listen to it again. And with this game, that's probably completely intentional. While we're on the audio, a quick note on the voice acting, which is generally really good. The only weird thing is that they don't voice the lines you see on screen, instead they say completely random things when you first enter a conversation. It takes a bit of getting used to. I kept reading one thing while listening to another and ended up not properly taking in either. You do get used to it though. Just find the right lines. Connect all the dots. Then you'll see the answer. Story-wise, you need to find your father's killer, although as you might expect, this does often take a backseat to the plague that's killing hundreds every day. And then there's the weird stuff that you've probably seen a fair bit of on screen by now. Artemy takes most of this in his stride. You're not here to understand exactly what's going on, or explain the supernatural occurrences, or marvel at the non-human creatures. They are there as the backdrop to a bewildering experience that develops in a town where each district is named and sometimes designed after the body of a bull. You spend half your time wondering whether it's all a dream or a performance piece, and the other half wondering whether you even care if it is or not. This is a town where children are the only ones who have their shit together and risk their lives to enter infection areas, creating maps to help you navigate the deliberately confusing town. There are the nightly theatre performances where you're outright told that you're just part of a performance, and a gravity-defying tower looming over the town. There's weird stuff like a girl who talks to the dead, if they are even dead at all, and that sits alongside the normal stuff, such as employees on strike at the local factory. It's as if the game is daring you to question the logic behind it all. 
The journal plays a big role in this. There's no rigid quest structure with missions divided into mandatory and side quests. Instead your journal is a series of thought bubbles that link together as you get more of the answers or result in dead ends if you don't. While some thoughts are given more prominence on screen than others, the seemingly insignificant stuff can end up being crucial. It's tough to know what you should do at any given moment and you can't do it all because of the time constraints. Many quests expire if you don't do them within a strict time limit that you're often not told about. You can even miss out on quest rewards if you don't collect them promptly. For example, at one point you're given daily quests to complete at the hospital, like curing a certain number of patients or gathering organs from local organ donors. A city fund provides rewards if you complete your duties, but if you don't swing by to pick up the reward before the end of the day, it's assumed that you want your very generous reward distributed amongst the townsfolk. Whatever it is you choose to focus on, the game rarely assumes you've completed or even started other quest lines, with most of the stories operating relatively independently. I was worried that such a bizarre storytelling structure would result in the game tripping all over itself by the end, but the conclusion managed to be surprisingly satisfying, even as someone who didn't understand half of what was going on or why. I don't have all the answers or even really care. Strangely, it doesn't feel all that important. I'm sure the two DLC storylines will clear some things up, but they'll likely introduce their own set of questions too. Pathologic 2 isn't a game we're ever going to have a complete understanding. The NPCs have a degree of independence and will even lie to you if it suits their own interests. They're not just there to serve the player. Even if you think you know what's going on, you might not actually know. It's hard to overstate just how effectively Pathologic 2 puts you on the edge of despair and keeps you there for hours at a time. Perhaps the best example of how soul consuming the survival aspect is can be seen in the things you don't focus on. There's a huge tower in the northwest part of the town. You can't miss it, it's weird and alien looking and is absolutely the most fascinating part of the environment. I had over 10 hours in the game before I wandered over there to take a look. I even ignored a couple of optional quests that would have taken me there. I was so focused on other priorities like saving the kid who was dying of the plague or well, trying to keep myself alive that I never bothered to check out the most fascinating part of the town. You develop a sort of tunnel vision where instead of being overwhelmed by the number of things you can do like in a typical open world game, you just focus on one thing at a time and take a modicum of pleasure from any win you get, even if it's as small as eating some bread or diagnosing an illness. And yes, that's diagnosing an illness, not curing it, because while you might have the right resources to correctly diagnose the location of the illness in the patient, you might not have the right treatment on hand. Even if you do have the treatment, all it does is reduce the chance of the infection killing the patient, it doesn't cure them. Still, one small step at a time, even if most of those steps are backwards. Labelling Pathologic 2 as a psychological horror game might sound a little odd given that I've spent most of this video discussing how important the survival elements are, and there is a subgenre of horror already devoted to this called, not surprisingly, survival horror. This could just be a consequence of the games I've chosen to play over the years, but I typically associate survival horror more with the likes of Resident Evil, where the survival aspect is more about a tangible threat like zombies than the more subtle impact of starving to death. The weird stuff like the reflection creatures and the strange buildings aren't enough to make something a psychological horror game, or at least not a good one as we'll see when we look at Blair Witch. Pathologic 2 fits so well into this category because the survival elements get into your head and bury their way in deep, impacting your mental and emotional state in a slightly creepy way. Like the protagonist, you start taking the weirdness in your stride and you don't question the absurd. The daily death toll update forces you to confront your failures on a regular basis while never celebrating your successes. Just because that immunity booster you gave little Timmy helped him avoid infection on day 4 doesn't mean he won't still get it on day 5 or 6. There's no such thing as victory and defeat, just defeat and delayed defeat. Keeping that in mind for 30 or so hours takes a significant toll. Pathologic 2 didn't achieve this by just including survival mechanics and having them be harsh. It's the way the survival mechanics link together and continuously affect the story that gives them so much impact. This is perhaps best illustrated by looking at an example of a game with similar mechanics that doesn't quite work, and that's We Happy Few. First a quick disclosure, I haven't finished We Happy Few, I'm not reviewing it, I'm just going from what I have played of it. I didn't love what I played, but it's not beyond redemption either. If someone swore blind to me that it gets better after 10 hours, I'd have no reason not to believe them. It still runs like shit though. Anyway, despite the very different visual style, We Happy Few has a lot in common with Pathologic 2, and I believe it's going for a similar creepy psychological horror vibe. Most notably, We Happy Few has many of these same survival elements, and it wants to elicit that survival vibe. Right from the start, you're a wanted man, much like in Pathologic 2, 
and the town is divided into zones that are sometimes dangerous to enter. We Happy Few wants you to feel like you're fighting against the odds trying to survive, while also figuring out what the hell is going on and you know maybe helping out the locals as well. The difference is that We Happy Few doesn't succeed in pulling this off, and too often it feels like any old open world game. You never really feel scared by the challenge to survive. It might be hard at times, but it's not the kind of difficulty that eats away at your soul. Most notably, the survival meters are a bit of a joke. Keeping those meters full is very much a chore that you just keep an eye on alongside the main event, which is the story, assuming you play story mode at least. Resources are everywhere. I guess it is possible to be caught short without a lockpick or a crowbar or the resources to make one, but even if you are, you know there's going to be one nearby or again the resources just to make one. Likewise with food and drink. Watching your meter get low is scary and pathologic too because you never know when you'll next get something to eat. In We Happy Few, you're never far from food. There's simply a complete lack of any tension when it comes to surviving. And without that tension, well, you don't feel scared. In terms of quest structure, We Happy Few follows the typical mould of a bunch of mandatory and optional side quests, few of which seem to be missable. It doesn't matter if you run low on food and need to go on a hunting expedition because, you know, that NPC will be right there waiting for you when you return. There also isn't any doubt or ambiguity about where to go or what to do. I don't mind a gentle introduction to crafting mechanics and things like that, but We Happy Few goes way beyond that. In addition to the ever-present waypoint markers, the protagonist even speaks out loud and not so subtly describes what you should be doing at any given time. Both games divide the play spaces into districts, with each having NPCs that react differently to the protagonist based on various factors. In Pathologic 2, those factors are relatively basic. If you're generous in your trades, run from fights and don't perform autopsies in the street, the citizens react warmly to you. As discussed, it's not necessarily easy to balance all this against the other demands the game places on you, but it is relatively easy to understand and fairly mechanical. It's video gamey if you like. We Happy Few manages to be even more simplistic than this, merely requiring the player to change clothes to fit in with the locals. You can have the whole town after you, disappear into a house, rub a stone over your suit to make it look a little worn, and then walk out to see everyone mutter about how oh, you're just one of them after all. While you do need certain crafting resources to pull this off, it isn't that taxing, and once again fits into the category of an annoying chore rather than a crucial game mechanic. And then there's the skill tree, with the distinction here being that We Happy Few has one and Pathologic 2 doesn't. I expect the inclusion of a skill tree in We Happy Few is by default as it's such a common feature nowadays. The skill tree provides benefits such as more effective healing items, better buffs and slower item degradation, so the more you play the more powerful you become. Power fantasies are fine for many games but I'm not convinced it's a good fit here where there is, at least on the surface, a focus on survival and horror. The other problem is that We Happy Few's skill tree and its general system of XP and rewards encourages you to take your time and tackle all the side content. Again, that is standard practice. Many games encourage you to engage with the side content through XP rewards, achievements and the like. But is that a good fit for a game with heavy survival aspects where you're supposed to feel under pressure? In Pathologic 2 it's not even clear what is a side quest and what is a mandatory quest, and when you do those side quests it's usually for the good of the town. Best or perhaps worst of all, you probably won't complete most of the ones you want to do because you're too busy prioritising your own well-being. I'm willing to bet that watching a child die of a disease you could have cured but opted not to because you desperately needed some sleep inflicts a much deeper sense of horror than any of the messed up things you come across in We Happy Few. Finally, Pathologic 2 does a better job having both the player and the protagonist on the same level when it comes to knowledge of the story. Even though the protagonist in Pathologic 2 is familiar with the town, it's changed a lot from when he lived here. He doesn't know many of the people and he certainly has no clue what's going on. In We Happy Few, the protagonist has to withhold a lot of information from the player and then slowly drip feed it out over the course of the story. He knows, he just chooses not to share it with you. Of course, We Happy Few isn't trying to be exactly the sort of game Pathologic 2 is. It's clearly not going for the soul-destroying feeling and that's fine, but maybe it should. As it stands, We Happy Few feels like just another game with survival elements tacked on. It's not brutal enough to be a good survival game, the combat isn't engaging enough for an action game, and the story isn't interesting enough to push you forward. Ice Pick Lodge deserves a hell of a lot of credit for understanding how difficulty can enhance the intended experience, instead of being the intended experience or trying to target a particular group of gamers. Unfortunately, being as hard as it is comes with the cost of limiting the potential audience, and that does seem to have been an issue here given the rumours of low sales. 
It's a shame because Pathologic 2's difficulty is different to more traditional difficult games. It isn't designed to frustrate or cause short-term feelings of euphoria when you overcome certain sections. With Bloodborne I used to get frustrated and then feel a huge sense of relief, joy and god only knows what else when I overcame those moments. It was a roller coaster. Pathologic 2 is more like one steep climb up a mountain with no easy moments and when you get to the top you realise there's no cool view and you might as well not have bothered. Pathologic 2 didn't review especially well, not with mainstream critics at least. And while it's tempting to see this as a failure of mainstream games criticism, I think the issue lies a little deeper. First of all, I personally would only give Pathologic 2 a 4 out of 5 myself. It doesn't run all that well with a slowdown of regular occurrence when you enter new areas, especially if those areas are infected and therefore have a bunch of particle effects on screen. There's also the terrible fighting system and character animations are pretty laughable. I also found the pacing to be way off in the final third, which dragged on for far too long for my tastes. I was ready for the game to be over about 7-10 to 10 hours before I actually was. Pathologic 2 doesn't earn 5 stars in my book, but it does earn a bunch of other labels such as interesting and original. Yes, there are a lot of games demanding our time these days, but how many of them really do anything like Pathologic 2? The problem with the review scores might lie in how we demand reviewers complete games before reviewing them, because I'd argue Pathologic 2 isn't a game that needs to be finished to review. During my playthrough I got myself into a complete mess around A7. I stupidly saved my game while low on health and infected, and there was no way to cure the infection or get more health before I died. I tried reloading a couple of older saves but found that I dug myself into a hole quite a bit before the actual death, and if I wanted to continue playing I'd have to go back at least 2 hours of game time. I considered quitting here, not necessarily in frustration or anger, but just because I'd had enough. Pathologic 2 had hit me hard and I'd played for something like 15 hours already. I had no regrets about playing it and could have written nearly this entire script without any changes. In the end I obviously did continue, but nothing in the rest of the game changed my opinion. If anything it might have dragged it down slightly because the first half or two thirds feel denser and more rewarding. I'm fortunate enough that I can take my time with reviews, but reviewers are often given the game a week or so before the embargo and are therefore on a time crunch. Up to the point where it all went wrong for me I was looking favourably on the game and would have given it a positive review, but if I then had to restart from an old save and force my way through to the end in a rush to hit an arbitrary deadline, then yeah I would have grown to hate the game a bit. If I'd been allowed to stop and review the game after 15 hours, which is perfectly acceptable runtime for a $35 game, I would have been encouraging everyone to give it a shot with even less hesitation. Because here's the thing, maybe you don't need to complete Pathologic 2. You could just buy it, play it and stop playing it when you've had enough. There are many games, especially roguelikes, where I never make it to the end, but I have a great time regardless. Pathologic 2 is a game where nearly every NPC you meet ends up either dying or getting perilously close to death. Why should the protagonist be any different? How much of a game a reviewer needs to play has been on my mind a lot lately and I expect to see the line move over the next 5 years because well, the concept of completing a game is starting to become meaningless, with so many games focusing on live service models. Half the time reviews are out of date the day a game is released. Anyway, I would encourage you not to be too put off by the low critical reviews, but also don't get angry about them, which to be fair you never really should. It's more down to a flaw in the review process, especially at the mainstream publications, than it is of any one reviewer. GameSpot for example might have given Pathologic 2 a 5 out of 10, which I can completely understand by the way, but at least GameSpot reviewed it, which is more than I can say for many of the big places. I'd be willing to bet the lack of attention hurt Pathologic 2's sales more than any average review scores. It's a shame more people didn't just play the amount of the game they wanted to play and then talk about it instead of feeling compelled to complete it. Then there's the other horror game I played this month. As you can tell I'm not going to talk about this one for anywhere near as long because it isn't anywhere near as interesting. Blair Witch is much more analogous to a walking simulator or first person narrative experience if you like, but we know from games like Soma that it is still possible to create a psychological horror experience while on a tight leash. You sacrifice a lot of the tension and stakes in games like this but the story can still haunt you, which should be obvious given that there is such a thing as horror in film, TV and books which require no interaction. Blair Witch fails to do anything interesting with the structure to add tension, but really the problem is that the story is dull and certainly not scary. Blair Witch takes place in 1996, two years after the events of the first movie. I've only ever seen the first one so to the extent there are cool references to the sequels in here they will be completely lost on me. Actually come to think of it I watched the original 20 years ago and don't remember much of it beyond the whole shaky cam thing. You play as Ellis who goes into the woods to search for a missing 9 year old boy with the help of his trusty dog Bullet. 
There's already a full search team in there, but Ellis is desperate to help, having nothing much else to do since he left the police force. Or was maybe put on long-term leave, I'm not too sure. Right from the start, it's clear that Ellis is dealing with a few issues of his own, which become evident via tense conversations with his girlfriend and the sheriff who reluctantly accepts his help on the search, so long as he doesn't get in the way. If you're a Blair Witch fan, then it's worth knowing up front that there isn't much witch in here. In fact, it's impossible to escape the feeling that the license was added to an existing title relatively late in development, because this is largely just a horror story in the woods with some symbols and a familiar looking house. Blair Witch starts strong. The first hour or so consists of light exploration, where you look for clues about the boy's disappearance. There isn't a lot to do, but well, you'd expect that. It's setting the scene. The game looks pretty and traipsing around the woods at night is suitably creepy. Even using the radio and an all too familiar mobile phone feels appropriate and helped pull me into the setting. You order Bullet to look out for clues and follow trails and of course you can pet him if you like. When Bullet first got freaked out and refused to move any further due to the infamous symbol hanging from a tree I got my hopes up thinking we might be in for something special here. There were no threats at this point or the potential for failure but that didn't matter. I assumed we would ramp up to that and well we do but in a truly disappointing way. Having the player follow an adorable dog through the woods is the easy part. The challenge is going to come when the payoff. Unfortunately, the more Blair Witch tries to keep the player engaged through gameplay mechanics, the more it fails to do so. It's a shame because Blair Witch does have some cool mechanics, it just fails to do anything interesting with them. Take the video camera for example. You find tapes around the environment and can watch them on the camcorder. If the tape has a red stripe on it, which most of them do, then watching the tape changes the surrounding environment. For example, let's say your path forward is blocked by a fallen tree. Somewhere nearby there's a tape which shows that tree falling down. If you watch the tape while near the fallen tree, you can watch it fall in real time or rewind and watch it rise back up. Pausing the tape before the tree has fallen means the tree is out of your way and now you can walk down the path. I love this concept, it's a cool puzzle idea for a start and it also fits in perfectly with the franchise and the game. I suspect most people's prominent memories of the Blair Witch films were camcorders. So this is a nice way to bring them in. It's also great for a horror game where weird shit is supposed to be going down anyway. In another example you watch someone run through a door, close it behind them and lock it. The door is locked when you first arrive, but if you stop the tape while the door is still open, well you can now go through it. The bad news is that this is about the extent of these puzzles. The door trick is repeated multiple times, and the absolute toughest challenge is when you have to pause the video twice to make it past obstacles. Even that couldn't really be much simpler because the obstacles in question are right next to each other. I'm not crying out for really difficult puzzles as such, that would kind of interrupt the flow, but can they at least be a little more involved, like having to search for clues in the videos instead of just pausing them in the correct place, or just combining tricks across multiple videos would be a good idea? As things stand, when you pick up a tape you're likely already in the correct place to use it and then you just discard it immediately afterwards. Other interesting touches include sections where you can't look directly at the enemies and must use markers on the floor to navigate around, which you can only see when you look through the video camera. It's another neat idea, but you end up just following a white line around, which ironically makes navigation easier and less tense, because you always know where you're going. And there won't be jump scares because you're just looking at a black and white image in the camera. Even some cheap tricks like having the camera battery get low and maybe the display flicker could have added a bit of tension. I'm also sad to say that your relationship with Bullet is another one of those things that feels underbaked. I liked sending him off to find clues and then giving him a pet or a treat as a reward, but it seems like he was supposed to play a bigger role. Early on Ellis has a panic attack of sorts when Bullet gets too far away, and the game tells you to stay close to Bullet at all times. One of the commands has you order Bullet to stay close, so it seemed like this would be a feature except I never used it because he always stays close anyway. There's also a cheap attempt at emotional manipulation around Bullet which is too obvious for my tastes. Graphics wise Blair Witch is a bit all over the place. The environments look decent enough although there is a lot of aliasing. There's an excellent visual effect near the end as the house repairs itself in front of your eyes, it's absolutely stunning. On the other hand one of the major enemy types is a big ball of leaves which looks like this. As you can tell I can't even talk about what Blair Witch does right without picking on all the problems and we haven't even gotten into the really bad stuff yet. The main one has to be the story and particularly the ending which is a complete mess. It doesn't take long to work out what happened in Ellis's past to torment him so much, which leads you to think that perhaps the rest of the game will be about overcoming those mental demons, but instead the details slowly come out until we have the whole picture. There's no satisfying resolution to any of it, it just ends. There are multiple different endings but I'll be damned if I can figure out how your actions affect them. 
I decided to look it up online and apparently it's to do with how you look after your dog and whether you defeat monsters you come across. And actually knowing that is worse than not knowing. I'm going to have to bring up Pathologic 2 again because looking at that game we can consistently see throughout the game the consequences of our actions, and the endings don't come out of the blue. Not only are Blair Witch's endings bad and unsatisfying in their own right, they aren't a natural conclusion to what came before. The other major problem is the lack of any tension during the game. You can die in a couple of places, but if you do the checkpoint system brings you back right before the place where you died, which really is more of a symptom than a problem itself. I mean, it's not like I'd rather sludge through the last 10 minutes of walking all over again just for the sake of added tension. A walking simulator with poor checkpointing is a really bad combination. The problem comes in the lack of any other consequences. How a fool I know the number of times you die could somehow be tied into the ending you get, but that doesn't add a lot to the experience if you don't know about it. Locking the player into the typical walking simulator experience nearly always leads to these kinds of limitations. It's why that genre tends to focus on storytelling over anything more action oriented. This doesn't have to be the case of course. I've argued before that What Remains of Edith Finch is an excellent example of the genre, managing to incorporate gameplay in a way that enhances the story. However, not every game can meet that high standard and that's fine. The most appropriate comparison that comes to mind for Blair Witch is Soma. Soma is an absolutely brilliant game and I highly recommend you play it. I'm pretty sure it's been given away free on a bunch of different platforms, so there's a good chance you already own it. With that in mind, there will be Soma spoilers from here on out. Please stop watching the video here if there's any chance you'll play Soma in the future, because that game is something special, and like Pathologic 2, it's best experienced going in blind. Okay, with that out of the way, Soma is, like Blair Witch, a walking simulator with a psychological horror spin. Both games ease you into things, starting off nice and bright and relaxed before throwing you into darkened environments, with mysterious beasts to avoid and some light puzzles to solve. The puzzles in Soma are a little stronger than those in Blair Witch, although they still aren't really a selling point as such. As in Blair Witch, Soma's enemies and attempts at imposing a typical video game challenge were by far its weakest feature. There were rudimentary stealth sections dotted around all over the place, and in another similarity of Blair Witch, you had to look away from enemies to recover. You could die relatively quickly and easily, although you never lost a lot of progress. Perhaps more than in Blair Witch, but not enough that the act of avoiding enemies was anything more than an annoyance. I reviewed Soma and gave it 4 stars, with probably the main thing holding it back from 5 stars being the presence of those enemies. I felt that removing them completely and leaving the player free to explore the otherwise interesting locations and read all the journal entries and the like would have made it a better experience. Just a couple of weeks after I reviewed Soma, Frictional Games announced that it was patching in a new mode that removed enemies completely, which just goes to show that I have terrible timing when it comes to playing games in my backlog. Regardless, you can imagine Frictional Games went through many of the same discussions as Bloober Team when it came to trying to add a threat to a game that didn't have a combat system of note, or at least not one that was fun in its own right. Neither game needed one, Frictional Games realised that and patched it out. It's a shame Bloober Team didn't pick up on this and abandon its own attempts at enemies and fail states. That said, Soma succeeded spectacularly when it came to the story, which kept me engaged all the way through. Often horror stories, whether they be in a movie, TV, book or game form, tend to be less scary the more time passes. You learn more about what's going on and start to uncover the main threat. The gradual removal of mystery around the big bad or whatever the threat is tends to lessen the stakes somewhat, at least as far as the horror aspect for the viewer or reader is concerned. Soma flips that on its head by becoming increasingly horrifying the more you play and the more you uncover. I would say the scariest reveal comes at the end, but you can figure it out before that. Still, the tension only increases and the consequences of your actions become darker and darker. In Soma, you play as Simon, who suffers from brain damage and agrees to undergo an experimental brain operation. He has a brain scan in a somewhat sketchy looking facility, and the next thing he knows he's waking up nearly 100 years in the future in an underwater base as one of the last surviving members of the human race. Most of your time is spent trying to leave the sub for the Ark to preserve the future of humanity. However, Simon isn't really Simon, or at least he's not the Simon you played as in the intro. His brain scan was downloaded into a new body, and during the course of the game his brain is transferred once again. Of course, to the player this all happens instantaneously, and it's all presented as one continuous story, which in a way it is. Other brain scans are used when you download them into robotic bodies to question former members of the crew, although they never last all that long before dying. At some point, either right at the end or shortly before, it dawns on you what the real consequence of all this body hopping is. 
Simon isn't moving from one body to another. His brain scan is copied from one body to another. You play as the new copy each time and get to continue the story, but there's always the previous version who has to live on in whatever precarious situation you left them in. That also means every time you copied a brain scan over to a robotic body to ask questions that would help you with a puzzle, you were bringing someone to life and then killing them. Worst of all, at the end the game finally treats you not as the new copy but as the existing version, leaving you in the underwater base with no hope for the future, while a copy of yourself gets to go and live a new life on the Ark. Everything Simon went through was for nothing, well for him at least, as in for that specific version of him. He succeeded in his mission but doesn't get to reap any of the benefits. Now this summary obviously doesn't do it justice, you really need to play the game. But the point is it's a story that generates discussion around the nature of these brain scans and what happens to the version that isn't copied over. It's a form of existential horror. Imagine you were in Simon's position and needed a new body. Would you agree to be scanned? A version of you would go off and live in another body, but you would stay in your own one. You'd be saving a person who doesn't technically exist yet. Just the fact that there is something to think about means Soma goes far beyond Blair Witch when it comes to the psychological impact of its story, and it shows that a game can still be scary without jump scares or the threat of losing progression. Soma gets into your head and stays there. There isn't much else to say about Blair Witch, it isn't offensively bad, everything works and for the most part it is coherent, but it doesn't do or say anything remotely interesting. Pathologic 2 and Blair Witch were released for roughly the same price at $35 and $30 respectively but they offer two very different experiences. Pathologic 2 is huge the first time round, and that's not including the upcoming DLC that will presumably offer at least one major new experience. Blair Witch is a disappointing 5 hour walk through the woods. I would have been better off just watching the trilogy or actually even going on a walk through the woods. I wish I could give Pathologic 2 a glowing review and a wholehearted recommendation because it is one of those games you want other people to play, but it is a little held back by its problems such as a slow final third poor combat and shoddy performance. Pathologic 2 doesn't do much new on the face of it, survival mechanics are everywhere now. However, it's the way these mechanics fit together and intertwine that helps create a masterful psychological horror experience that not many games can match. My review comes with some heavy caveats, but if you can get through the problems, Pathologic 2 should be a memorable experience. With any luck, Pathologic 2 will become an inspiration for the genre going forward and not a promptly forgotten side note in gaming history. Blair Witch on the other hand, well that won't stick in the memory for long. Ok I hope you enjoyed this video, if you did please consider hitting like, sharing the video and subscribing if you haven't already. Hopefully this video will bring a little more attention to a game that seems destined to get the hidden gem label stuck on it in a few years. If there are any similar games that you think have crept under the radar then feel free to let me know in the comments. As always for the dedicated among you I have a Patreon where you can sign up for a dollar a month which gets you your name in the credits, and a special Patreon role in my Discord server. The next video won't be The Witcher 3, but I'm not exactly sure what it will be. I have a few ideas in mind so just watch this space. Alright until next time, cheers.